Hello and welcome to Clamp, the Creating, Living, and Making podcast. I am your host, Grant Alexander, and joining me, as always, is the magnanimous Morley Kurt. Hello. And the other magnanimous Maker Mackey. G'day, mates. <laughs> oh, God. We got an Australian on the show this week. Because <laughs> we don't normally... <laughs> Normally, you don't like to use the slang. You like to try and yeah. blend in with your your American I'm just not, I'm just football not a, fans. I'm just not a bogan Australian. That's all. Okay, I'll just throw <laughs> another another prawn on the Barbie. Uh, what's thank in your you? Clamps? <laughs> we don't call them damn shrimp. <laughs> what's in your clamps this week, uh, Morley? All right. Um, well, I finished up the spice rack that I was working on. Um, very happy with how it came out it's probably my favorite thing i've made i will say this year um i'll say it's my favorite thing i made this year um it was definitely challenging um cutting 45 degree miters with a circular saw and a speed square um (laughs) and doing some test pieces and test fits and finding what was really 45 and then adjusting um but it was incredibly Uh, satisfying Um, my original design for it also incorporated some like dowels, uh, basically on like, this will make more sense once you see the video, which hopefully will be out by the time the podcast comes out. But on like the open ends of the zigzag, I was, my first idea was to have some dowels there to reinforce it. Cause I was worried that it'd be too flexible or that mm-hmm. there'd be too much stress in those joints. Um, but as I started thinking it through more, um, I realized they wouldn't really be necessary. I was confident enough in those miter joints And also just the way I mounted it, there's not really much stress on those joints. That's mostly what it comes down to, the way it's mounted to the wall, um, which is really um, just command strips, uh, which uh, Eden was skeptical of, but I use enough of them. I am also (laughs) skeptical. Nah, it's solid. It's not going anywhere. Um, It's surprisingly not very heavy uh, and with spices. I calculated it all out. I checked the weight capacity on the uh, picture hanging command strips um, and... I'm well below the threshold and I added extra just in case clean the surfaces really nicely. Cause that's a big factor when it comes to hanging stuff with those. Um, and it's solid. There's no ominous creakings, no saggings where we loaded it up over and above the pictures I sent you and Adam, um, or Grant and Adam. And it's good. It's been there for the past few days. You, the listener and you, Adam. The listener and Adam. Grant didn't get a copy. I don't know why I said you as uh, like, I'm talking, well, I guess I was looking at Grant. I was looking at the screen. Um, but yeah, I'm very happy with it. Um, it's it's always nice when you have like an idea for something and you think it's going to be a little screwy. There's some challenges. You overcome them and it comes out like slightly better than you expected. So, What is the name of the color that you used? Because I really like it. Yeah, it's about the same thing. Um, so it's, it's just a light blue. Uh, let me just – I'll try to get up the uh, – no, that's what the color is called. So it's I just like a thousand I bought some, shades of blue, but okay. It's what it's called. So I bought uh, some acrylic paint just from the local art store. Um, mm-hmm. It's like the cheapest acrylic paint you can buy. I think it's called natural. Uh, sorry, that's Penny playing with her ball toy. Let me uh, find the. I, I don't know if it's the, the pictures you sent, but it looks more turquoise than. It is. It is kind of turquoisey. Um, so it's Liquitex basics, acrylic paint. I'm not sure if that's in other countries, but, uh, it's like, you know, seven to $8 for a 118 milliliters. Um, Mm, cool. Yeah. And it's kind of like a turquoisey light blue. And, um, my, actually my original idea was to use leather dye on the face green, but I did a test piece and it looked God awful because I had some blue leather dye, like really bad. (laughs) It bled. It was the wrong shade. Um, we have orange tile floors in there. And we have blue leather cushions on, like turquoise blue leather cushions on our seats. So it, it fits the color scheme of the room really nicely with like the kind of Spanish style blue orange contrast with the white walls. So, and you have a um, 1950s table, apparently. Yeah, at least. So that fun fact that is the table that Eden grew up using. So uh, nice. We're we're in the apartment that we're in used to be her brother and his wife's. Um, and when they moved into this apartment, uh, they got that table from Eden's parents and they left it here for us. 
So, and when Eden's parents bought that table, they bought it used. They bought it at like a yard sale. <laughs> so it has I love it. Had quite the life. Did you use a circular saw to cut something on top and not think about how deep the blade was? <laughs> Why is the table cut in half? Oh, oh, it's like a folding table, technically. Oh, like but, it's but the legs are the legs are solid. Um, I I don't know. I've never actually uh, collapsed it before, but it, it like splits in two. Is <laughs> it is it not for extra leaves so you can extend it? I don't know, but why that we, might be it? I think that's I it actually. Why did I start talking about a table? That's not. Yeah, the, the that's, that's not the build. <laughs> if you watch the video, you'll see it in like the very end. <laughs> <laughs> it just flashes uh, on for a split second. Yeah. Anyways, so that's been good. Um, so hopefully I'll get that for this Monday. And that's been my main making this week. Uh, Grant, are you done sanding your trailer yet? Uh, never. Never. Mm -hmm. I, the answer is going to be never until it is until one day it is done. But really, I've done the first uh, – I'm actually, I think I'm done. I'm going to do another once over uh, with the whole trailer again tomorrow. But I think I'm actually done filling in all of the – uh, holes that I wanted filled in and all of the like chips of the gel coat and everything like that and fixing up all the cracks that I wanted to fix up and I've sanded it to 80 grit the entire thing every bit that I can reach is uh, has been sanded once I pop the frame off there's a couple spots around the frame that I just right now don't want to deal with hand sanding so I'm going to be I'll pop it off the frame and then I can easily reach them because the frame won't be in the way. Um, and then when you go to paint, it's a lot, you know, you can get there with a brush. Um, so but the, to answer your question, Morley, no. Um, and I don't expect for at least the next two weeks to be done. So you guys are going to hear more about sanding and fiberglass work. But uh, I've, I've never actually done uh, fiberglass resin work. Um, like I was using uh, polyester resin. And I did one, I didn't really know the difference between epoxy resin and uh, polyester resin, but I had polyester nice long resin cover. is super smelly, right? I don't know. I don't have a sense of smell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's extremely smelly. I don't know. So yeah. maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. I was working outside and uh, my dad came up and was helping me because it was also my birthday. But uh, he, uh, and, and the restrictions are lifted. So this is the first time since. Uh, well, at Christmas, I saw him for a little bit when I dropped off presents. So it's been six months. Uh, but he came up and helped me because he's done some work before. I also uh, had a nice conversation with uh, Austin from High Caliber Craftsman because he used to use polyester resin for doing uh, surfboards. surfboards. And uh, he gave me a lot of good info and tips. And I've read a lot. And it actually worked out super, like, way easier than expected. Like it was easy, peasy, beautiful cover girl. Like that's how easy it was. Hmm, so nice. That's that's what I've been working on. But I think I'm all done the the main uh, things, and then I'm going to be priming and sanding, and then painting and sanding and sanding and sanding. And one day I'll finish sanding, and then I can start rebuilding it. If anyone's that wondering. So Sorry, did you ahead. say that the caravan is going to be a video or not? Maybe. Maybe. I filmed a whole bunch of it. Okay. So I'm filming a bunch of it. I don't know how much. It, like the, I'll put together maybe a video, but I know it's it's definitely not going to be how to. It's going to be yeah. more like I've watched a bunch of Laura comp videos where she does caravan uh, or RV like rebuilds mm -hmm. uh, and. Like some of them are more in depth, some of them are a lot less. Like, here's a shot, here's another shot, boom, trailer's done. Feeling like to them, and I'm, I think that's what mine's going to be. Yeah, that's what right. I was thinking last night, last week when we were talking about it. Yeah, and I just, I'm not good because I don't have a, a good way of doing close up shots. I know I can use my phone, but when I'm in the mix of it, I never do. Um, I feel like I never get good shots. For that, when I go later and look at it, I go, I don't know. I just look at it and go, I don't, I don't like how this all came together. I feel like I needed more or different shots. And in the moment, I'm not taking enough. And then when I look at them later, I, I don't know. I just need more experience doing that, I think, is, is the reality there. Hmm. 
So to answer your question, Adam, maybe. Hmm. What's what have you been working on this week? Well, what's in your class? I finally. I, I know I talked about it a bit last week, but the episode didn't come out until after. I finally put out my first video for the workbench. Nice. Um, which is doing pretty poorly, to be honest. <laughs> Um, well, how, how long has it been since you put out a video? Oh, a while. Yeah. A few month or so. Um, but in saying that, so I've put out uh, episode one. Episode two is going to come out in about 12 hours. And then episode three will be a week later. So all three episodes or well, videos are on YouTube already, ready and scheduled. And wow, everything is done, ready to go. So pretty exciting to like actually have three videos like ready to come out. I, I really think once you've released parts two and parts three, YouTube will see them as one big conglomeration and start recommending them. Yeah. That's I hope I so. Found. Yeah. I'm also putting them in their own playlist as well, which I think will help. Um, hmm. But More I was just looking at analytics now and like my views aren't that high, but my watch time is pretty high. And um, I've also gained two subscribers from it as well. So nice. I don't know. We'll see how, how that goes. But um. Yeah, so that, and then I've started working on another project. Um, if anyone follows me on Instagram, they would have seen I've been doing a lot of painting and I'm making a dog crate. A dog I crate think. or a dog house? A dog crate. So, well, I call it a crate. It's like a, it's like a dog kennel, but it's for inside. So, mm. so you take like a buffet and turn the bottom into like a kennel where the dog can mm. sleep during the night, but then you still have like the function of a buffet on top and the drawers and all that sort of stuff. Um, and interestingly, yesterday I was working on the top that I took off it and just decided that it just wasn't thick enough and like really cheaply made. Um, so I'm going to be making up a new top. And I only just realized now that I have never glued up a top before other than like my old workbench, but like I've never made a nice tabletop. So, so for the American listeners, listeners, a buffet is the same thing as a credenza. I don't. I, I don't even know. It was. I don't even know if buffet is the right thing. Maybe a hutch. No, it is. I looked it up. Yeah, hutch is buffet, also the credenza, same. same thing. Yeah, hutch mm. is also a word for it. Right. I wonder. Mm. Is it like sofa versus Chesterfield versus couch? I never heard of Chesterfield uh, until I worked at the lodge. That was when someone said that for the first time. I was like, "Are you? What are you talking about? Are you speaking another language?" <laughs> I don't think it's I credenza. Think it's, I think it is. I think buffet and credenza are the same thing. I think actually a hutch is something different. It looks like a buffet is, I don't know. If so, I Google them, well, the same pictures come up. <laughs> so essentially think of like a credenza, but then it's got three doors on the bottom, two drawers above that. Uh, sorry, three drawers above that. So each door has a drawer above it. So I guess it's more of a hutch than a buffet. Um, Cause this li Google literally says credenza is Italian for cupboard. But go to images. Right. Anyways, <laughs> this is so <laughs> riveting audio content. Right. Well, I'll just put this out before we move on. I'll just put this out here. Americans like to take a word, use it incorrectly, and then give it a new meaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so in saying that, yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited to like actually make a tabletop. I've never I've never had to like mill like I mean I did my coffee table, but that, that was a bit different because it was live edge, but I've never like actually had to mill up everything square enough to get a nice top. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Um, would you call that a DIY project? Yes, I actually definitely would. Um, it's are like you, a, are you a selling Pinterest it? DIY. I am going to be selling it. Yes. So this is where I think, when does it become you're a professional and when is DIY ending? Or because I, I've always like do it yourself if you're doing it yourself, right? But at what point do you become someone who's doing it, you know, for profit or something? Like I think, a, you know, I, I made a, a couple of cutting boards and... I did them myself, but if I started doing like Vincent, where he's making a lot of cutting boards and he's selling them, he's still doing it himself, but he's now turned it into a business, right? Um, yeah. 
my, my, my thought on DIY is a project, not multiple, a project that you do instead of hiring someone else to do it. But so, if somebody hires you to do it, is it DIY? No, because you've been commissioned to do it professionally. Right. So are you so selling the yes. dog crate? I am selling the dog crate, but I would consider – but see, it's a DIY project. I, I haven't been commissioned to do it, though. That's what I'm saying. If someone If someone asked me to do it because I have the expertise in that field, then it's not a DIY project. But, and then also to, uh, I mean, if, I guess if I made it from scratch, I wouldn't call it a DIY project, but because I've taken an old buffet or hutch and turning that into it, I think it's a DIY project. It's something you would see on Pinterest that people would do. Hmm. And so it's, it's an you- interesting distinction because I feel like what you're saying is the level of difficulty makes it do not it yourself the, versus non Not the yourself, level of difficulty, but more the professionalism of the person that's doing it or the expertise of the person that's doing it. Like if you, if you, if you make a furniture, if you're like a furniture maker that makes furniture and sells it and like, that's your primary job. I wouldn't say that's DIY, but if you make yourself a dining table, I would say that's DIY. But what if you're a furniture maker who makes himself a dining table? That's not DIY because you've, that's your profession. Right. This is where I think the, the lines of DIY are blurred. And, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. And I think it's an interesting thing to talk about a little bit because there's the like Reddit community r slash DIY, which really should change their name to r slash how to, because that's all they care about is whether or not you give a how to on how to do something. Yeah. But they're like, when I look at like someone like, like, so I got a comment the other day on a picture frame making video. And the comment was, well, not all of us have a giant table saw in our garage. And I'm like, I don't know. You you may not. Then hire someone to do the thing, right? Like mm. use a hand saw, figure out a different way, use a miter saw. Like there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I'm showing you how to do it with a table saw, right? Like I don't understand this. Like they were basically saying to me that my, you know, the saw that you can get for a hundred dollars all day on Kijiji was Mm -hmm. made it not a kind of DIY project. And I just went like, where does DIY stop? Like if you own a CNC, is that DIY? So I think with many, you know, terms that are rooted in um, culture and society that aren't just like a purely objective definition, you have to think about like how people are using it. So when someone searches the term DIY or sees it in a title, you have to ask the question, well, what are they looking for? And I think at its most basic sense, they are looking to replicate it in some sort or see it in a way that is relatable. And I think at the further and further it gets away from relatability, that is when people start to feel frustrated or misled. Um, but that that function of relatability changes over time because like 20 years ago, 3d printers were very inaccessible, but now they are very accessible. So you could argue that a piece of furniture with a 3d printed part is more DIY than a piece of furniture with a domino machine or a domino. I don't know what it's called, like a domino maker, whatever the festival domino thing is called. So, you know, it kind of comes down to like, what is, what is relatable at that time and how people are sort of viewing something. It's all, it's, I mean, it's very subjective. Uh, I'm with you hundred percent on that. Yeah. And a festival domino is just a floating tenon. And if you went 50 years ago and said, I'm going to put floating tenons in something, people would be like, no problem. I know how to, I, I can do that. Right. Get my, my, my chisel out and, mm. you know, get, get drill and a chisel out and I can do that. Uh, it's definitely like a normal, it's the same thing as using a dowel. The domino just, makes it faster. I feel it's, like if you're using a festival domino, it's not DIY because if you have, if did you, you do it yourself? If, Let him finish. Yeah. Let but what, finish. what I'm getting at is if you have a festival domino in your possession, that means that you do this often enough to justify the cost. 
Like someone, someone's not gonna just gonna go buy a festival domino for their first project. Well, I mean, unless they're like a millionaire or something. But I don't know. I yeah, I don't think that's a, necessarily true. Like, I mean, if you look mm. at the grand scale of like, how much is a festival domino? Like, a th- I don't know, a thousand dollars, something like that. Sure. Well, yeah, close okay, to call, call it that. So, I mean, you can you can look at anything in someone's workshop and like look at the money they spend on it. I don't I don't think that's a great metric for for relatability because people can choose to spend money on so many different tools in their workshop or or different skills or something it's just like a singular factor um and and plenty of people will choose to buy expensive tools even if they're not a professional i mean anyone if you look at like the white collar professional who is a weekend woodworker they're probably more likely to buy expensive tools because they want them to work and be reliable um, exactly. but they are still probably doing it like in a DIY sense because that's not their main thing. If that's the definition you're going off of. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I don't know. I feel like there's, there's different types of DIY. I like, you know, yep. yeah. Like, you know, you could say anyone is really DIYing, but I feel like once you get like, I feel like there's a spot where it becomes not DIY and professional making. Um, but then you have like, pinterest diy which is like take this old thing and turn it into this other thing and i don't know i feel i feel like if you're paid to do it it's not diy i think the problem is that it's a it's a term that's used across the internet in many different contexts which is kind of like what you were just saying Hmm. and like i don't want to bring this conversation to a screeching halt because my my real opinion is that like i don't really think it matters i think it's my opinion is that like it comes down to like are you communicating what needs to be communicated for the video you know without like being necessarily misleading and i think it's tricky because like there's many different people who are watching quote maker videos on youtube there's people who are watching it for entertainment um i don't know what any of these percentages are there's people maybe who are watching it more for a how-to thing there are people who are trying to learn and build up a catalog in their brains and the creators are going to use the words in the titles of their videos that get lots of clicks and if people feel like they are using those titles that are misleading they they will naturally get angry because they're like well yes it's a popular term but i feel like i'm being misled because this isn't yeah. what i expected to come across so there's naturally going to be some tension there and i agree with you if i if you're talking about how to because if I put it in the title "How to" and then I don't explain anything, I can see that's maybe not a "How to" video. Yeah, right? I, I never put "How to." Right, but I've put "How to" on videos that I am very like step by step how to make this thing. Mm-hmm. But most of the videos are DIY videos. But I stopped putting DIY because people would say we well, didn't explain how to do it, and I went right because it's not a "How to" video, and I just stopped having that argument. But I do remember like when I was I, I posted a video to like this. This is where I learned this, like, how-to. Don't put how-to when it's not a how-to. Because one of my very first videos, I posted this, like, constructive criticism thread on Reddit for uh, small channels under 100, under 1,000 subscribers or something like that. And, like, everyone's just trying to get constructive criticism. Mm-hmm. And they gave me some great feedback on, you know, you didn't explain how to do it, so it's not a how-to video. And I went, you're right. But, you know, when I'm thinking about DIY – just to kind of shift it a little bit. I've got this uh, book for the viewers on YouTube. You can see it. Uh, It is a do-it-yourself encyclopedia from 1956 um, from Popular Science. And it's I only have letters uh, A to Boo, like the ghost saying Boo. I don't know why. Yeah, but uh, it's spooky. Um, It's got some fun, like little book jacket stuff. Anyways, uh, it goes into stuff that as a do it yourself or I go, wow, it is, it is doing some crazy stuff, you know, talking about like how to work with aluminum and like casting it. And it's like, well, if you start casting aluminum, is that DIY? Cause that seems like a, a pretty complex thing, but I if mean, you do it yourself, I think that, is losing the point of the purpose of DIY. I mean, the purpose of the whole DIY culture and movement is that you're doing things that would 
in other cases be outsourced to someone else. So just because something takes more equipment or more difficulty, I feel like saying that that is not DIY is entirely missing the point. Like mm. we, you should, I mean, I feel like as, as someone who strives to like attain skills and do things themselves and be a maker, like why not strive to do as complex and esoteric things as you can? And once it reaches it, why would you say that once it reaches a certain point of like particularity that like it's no longer fits within the category? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I agree. I was just trying to make the point. Uh, it's it's exactly that. Like as soon as long as you are doing it, like whenever I see someone who's got a you know a, a metal lathe or uh, an end mill or whatever those fancy metalworking things, and they're doing something themselves and they own these machines, which you can buy, you know, if you get a deal, you can get them for a couple hundred dollars, um, and start machining your own metal. It's DIY and. And, you know, I, I returned to the Zen and art of motorcycle maintenance. This guy had a, a metal lathe and did metal lathe stuff in his, you know, shop. I think it used to be more common, much like a 3D printer is becoming more common now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not everyone has it, but the people who are into doing stuff themselves have them. Yeah. Right. I mean, I almost see it as like, if you're taking the time to show all the steps in the video unless you're in a factory setting, like that almost to me is enough for it to be classified as DIY. Like you're showing it how someone could in a, in a, in a relatively non-professional setting do this thing. And right. as an individual or as a small team, you are doing it and showing it. So, so that seems to be the end of the story for me. Oh, I haven't uh, even oh. thought about it in a video setting, but I've, I've I, never thought of it that way. I just want to put this out there. Morley just raised a really good point. If you need two people to do something, is it DIY? I think actually, I think that actually that brings up a good other point, which is that I think, especially in America and I think in, in Western society in general, I think there's too much value put on individualism and why put something on a lower tier if it takes two or three people versus one person? I mean, all the, best things in the world were created by teams of people. Hmm. And I think if it's still, you know, the spirit of a relatively non-professional setting, someone doing things that you would expect uh, would take, I don't know, more than you, more than what they're showing, then why not have it fall into the category? Why does it have to be just one person? I mean, if you yeah, need two well, people to lift something that would be dangerous lift, with lifting one person, then you should probably lift that thing with two people. Like you should probably not try to, you should probably not risk like throwing out your back just for the sake of uh, individualism. Yeah, I, I've never thought of of DOI being like individualized. Um, I just had a thought as well, though. Of I feel like DOI is maybe a way of not a way. I feel like it's DOI if it's if you're making something or doing something that you don't have to go to a big company for if that makes sense. Like say for instance, cricket with like the, or, or any vinyl cutter. If you're like using a mug press or something, I feel like that's DIY because you're not paying some company to make it for you. Right. Yeah. But yeah. But if I pay someone with a, with a mug press to send me a mug, then it's not DIY. Right. I'm not saying I, I did it. But did they? Is it DIY for them? But, but but this is this is what I was trying to say before. Is that if you're if I'm pay, if I'm not doing it, and I'm paying someone to do it, then it's not DIY for me or them because they're being paid to do it. But if I did it myself, then it's DIY because if, I, if I'm outsourcing it, that means that it, like they I don't know. Again, I think it I think it depends on the context, and it might be missing the point because like even hmm. if you're doing it for someone else. You could have done the same thing for yourself, and with a cricket, it's a you know a relatively non-professional, non-industrial setting. So mm. to me, it still encapsulates like the spirit of the maker culture and DIY. Which the, I guess what I've been saying throughout this whole conversation is I see those things as like inextricably linked, like they are kind of like two sides of the same coin. Right. I, I hear yeah. you keep saying it like the maker culture and the DIY culture, and I think they're two separate cultures. Yeah, for sure. 
I think there, there's a Venn diagram of a lot of people are together in them. Hmm. But I think I I think DIY and maker movement are separate. Okay, so describe to me your archetypal maker and your archetypal DIYer. How are those two people different? Right. So I, I'll, I'll go and said on the extremes. A prop maker is a maker, but they may have no desire to do their hardwood flooring. Right? So they're definitely a maker, but they're not interested in DIY projects like home renovation projects. They're not interested in that. They just want to make some fun stuff. Then you go on the other extreme of someone who their only thing is I did it all myself. So I go into the woods and I'm making a cabin out of logs. I'm building my own log cabin, right? Like he's a maker for sure, but he's also like super straight on the I'm D I Y like, so I think there's those extremes that if you tried to tell the person who is a prop maker that they're a DIYer, they might be okay with it. But then they might also go, but I don't I don't do any of those home project things. Right? Mm-hmm. Like if there's a DIY network, none of my stuff is on there. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm I won't comment on that specifically because I, I don't feel equipped to but yeah i guess those two terms do have different connotations for many people and i wonder as well if adam savage didn't exist would you have those same differences in definitions i i I would because of like cosplay is another great like everyone who does cosplay there's there's people who do cosplay that that's all they do and they never will touch any other project Mm -hmm. and you know, I and there's lots of like people that I follow that they make amazing things and then they hire people to do everything in their house. Like when I think of like David Picciuto from Make Something, he talks all the time about how like could he do drywall? Yes, he could do drywall. He doesn't want to, and he doesn't think it'll make a good video, so he pays someone to do the drywall. Right? Right, right. Okay, so and I think that's interesting because like you describe like the archetypal versions of those two things. But the fact is that like 90% of people are somewhere in a spectrum between them. Of and course. even the most, even the person who's really into like DIY projects is always going to pay a professional to do certain things. They might not do their plumbing. They might not do their electrical. They might hire a locksmith to change their locks and not change their own locks. And like for the vast majority of cases, I think those people fall within those two things. And there's many people who wouldn't identify with either of those terms. So I feel like the Venn diagram of people who are in both of them is much larger than the difference between them. I I, I guess I'm I'm saying they have more in common than, than not. Right. Just like most of everything, most (laughs) of everything, people have more in common than they don't. But I I agree. Yes. I just mean there are differences. Like a lot of people who say they're, they're DIYers are say they're not makers. They're like, oh, I'm not a maker. I, I just do some home renovation projects. Like I think mm-hmm. of Dave Swidock, who keeps like denying he's a maker. And I keep going, well, did you make that? And he's like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, can you put two and two together there, Dave? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I guess it's it's strange to think about like the public perception of those two terms when you're also like very in it. You know, like like the three of us are. We are actively creating and sharing in those categories. And I don't know, maybe if someone was very, very targeted with what they're doing, like I can think of certain Instagram channels that really brand themselves as like a do-it-yourself thing versus a maker thing. And it's, it's lots of home renovation stuff. It's lots of um, home decor stuff. Um, then, it, then it also kind of comes down to marketing and keywords. And that's what I'm saying too with this is like, I feel like the real, the real differences between them is like search engine optimization and marketing, (laughs) but maybe that also reflects the true like cultural differences between the two things. I I think they're different. And I think we're belaboring the point, but I think they're different for reasons that we may not all understand to be able to talk about here. 
Uh, but if you have any other differences that you think would make a really interesting point or something we missed, let us know either on Instagram or uh, hit us up on one of the uh, Twitter. I think we tweet about it. Uh, you can go on Facebook, but <laughs> we don't do anything there. And uh, But yeah, come join us and tell us what we missed. But in, in reality, I do think, you know, the, the other thing is there's this whole channel called like uh, DIY and the why is is like spelt like why why did you do this? And mm-hmm. I always think about that channel when I think about DI like do it yourself projects instead of do it why like why did you do it? And I just think you know a lot of people are are just trying to have fun trying to do things right. So why do we like shit upon those people? Like, why do we give people so much crap for them doing something themselves? A hundred percent agree. I, I, it's it. I, I think a couple of years ago, I would look at that and find it kind of funny. But now I'm just like, eh. Like that was a real person who tried to do something. So exactly what you said. Like, why put that person down for what they're trying to do? And I think it's because people depersonalize strangers on the internet and they don't see them as real people, and they feel okay about talking down to someone virtually that they wouldn't in person. Um, Yeah. And it's, it's a defense mechanism. I'll put this out here. The people who are putting ramen noodles and everything to fix them. That's a meme. And that's a DIY, right? (laughs) Like, why are you putting ramen noodles to fix a cement wall? Well, because you can, right. And that's a different thing than the people who are just like trying to do something and it may not be, uh, Mm. You know, everyone can come up with a better solution to something. Yeah. Don't put someone down because they didn't come up with your solution. That That is that is half the reason why I never write how-to. And I like I, I don't make how-to videos. I, I make how I made videos because there are so many different ways to do something. And, and that's exactly right. Like, it's like the people that like, oh, I could make that too if I had $1,000 festival domino. Well, yeah, but there's other ways you could do it. So if you want to DIY it, you find a, a way that's price appropriate to you. Totally. And if you can't think of a way to do it without that tool, then pay someone else to do it. Mm. It's not a DIY project for you, right? Like I that's the way like, I look at it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Or just, I feel or like I'm conflicting tool. myself. Use it as an excuse episode. to buy the tool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I yeah, so I, I've never really like used the term or or like really think of the term DIY at all. Like, I consider myself a maker, not a DIY. Yes, I do do it myself, but I just that term's not really in my vocabulary to be honest. Like, like if you buy that- a flat pack from IKEA, does that consider does is that DIY? Like. Right, I I'm a hundred percent with like, you because I DIY'd my kitchen with IKEA. Yeah, like if you put a, if you put a flat pack coffee table together, you, you you put it together yourself. Is that like isn't that the whole point of IKEA? Is it DIY furniture? Well, isn't again, I think I think, it, I think it comes down to expectations. So, like if you're calling something like you know DIY assemble IKEA furniture, like there's nothing that's going to be lost in translation there. Like you are showing how one person on their own would assemble IKEA furniture. But if you're making it like you built that furniture from scratch, then it's another story and, and you're you're being kind of misleading in how you are sharing yeah, something. Exactly. I, I think it's interesting. Morley keeps referring like thinking about this in a how how does this relate to a YouTube video? Yeah, that's what I was saying before. I've never thought of it of like the video way. I'm 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 just thinking right, of or, just general making or, or sharing it online. And I just think about it like Am I doing it myself? Yeah. Regardless of if I didn't share it anywhere, is it DIY? Mm. All right. So I guess I only see the conversation as relevant when it comes to sharing things online. Because I, I honestly don't really think this conversation exists outside of online sharing of, of projects and things. All right. Let, let's take a quick example. That door behind Grant right now. If Grant was to hang that door himself, did he do it himself? He hung the door himself. So he, that was DIY of hanging a door. If he was to pay someone to do it, that person that he's paid to do it, are they DIYing? Probably. I, I wouldn't make any sense to really say that. Like, 
But that, this, this, <laughs> is what, this is what no. we're trying to say. Right. This is what we're saying is because you're paying him to do it and it, he's not doing it right. for his own needs, it's not DIY. Hold on. Even worse. What if I got my dad to hang the door? Yeah, see, this is very weird. Like, it's he, he's not doing it like he's doing it himself, but he's doing it for me in my house. Th- th- see, this like is a, a huge thing. damn rabbit hole. Well, okay. I think it's a very narrow rabbit hole, though. That really doesn't matter. I feel, I feel <laughs> like that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I think it. I think it only really applies when you're talking about like showing something on the internet. Cause I've never really mm. spoken to like, when you talk about someone in real life about something you've made, like, you know, you go into depth about like what you did and what it was for. And, and you talk about it in more nuance in in longer form than a simple, like, like make a, make a door and hang it yourself or like DIY yeah. book binding. Like you, you, you talk about things in a different way when it's, when it's not a caption. So I just I, don't see it as a, as a really relevant topic for outside of the internet. <laughs> I, I, I see where you're coming from, but if you were to say, take a DIY video off YouTube and you, you have no social following like media at all. If you were to take a DIY video off YouTube and copy it and do it yourself, is that person not DIY because they didn't share it? No, definitely not. But, it, but then, then it's like, if you're, Sorry, Grant, go on. I need to think about this thought. <laughs> right. So wh- where this comes out more for me is talking about it like with colleagues at work or with friends. Like if I say I redid my entire bathroom, but I bought the vanity, right? I bought a flat pack vanity that I had to mm-hmm. assemble. But the rest of the bathroom, the tile, the shower, I bought the shower base. Like is that is it a de- – like there's like parts that I buy and parts – like where does buying stop and DIY yeah. start, right? Like I mean, if I buy a shower door kit, I installed it myself, yeah. But I didn't make it myself. I didn't, I didn't cut the glass myself. I didn't, you know, I didn't make the glass myself, right? Like, yeah. So that's that's a good segue. Like this this whole conversation actually, I think, comes into play a lot when people talk about building a house or renovating a house. And many people will say they'll build their house even if they subcontract out many of the tasks um and contractors say like they're home builders even if they are not building every aspect of the house and i noticed it when i was doing one of my internships during school and i was i was working for um a subcontractor on like a it was at a construction site at mit in boston we were we were part of a team that was working on like a 500 million dollar nanotechnology laboratory and it was interesting to see the way people talked about tasks on the construction site. So the company I was working for was specifically making non-structural walls and light gauge metal framing. And the foreman was kind of the guy I was interacting with the most. And he was in charge of all the carpenters who would be putting everything up. And he would say, I need to build this wall or today, like, like I'm going to build this wall, but it wasn't really him doing it. It was the carpenters underneath him. And Mm. I think a lot of times when people talk like that, they talk about it number one, for ease of communication with other people in the field and, and just for speed. Um, and the, the, the thought of like what you're actually doing with your hands kind of in that, to, in that sort of setting doesn't take full primacy. Um, hmm. Hmm. It, it's kind of like how managers speak versus how people, you know, who are actually doing the work with their hands speak. Yeah, right. to, to to take it back a second to when Grant was talking about his dad hanging the door, one word that you use there, which I think a lot of people take into play with DIY, especially on the Reddit, is the word for. Not do it yourself, do it for yourself. So did your dad hang the door? Is that DIY? Or if you hang the door, you hung the door for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think that makes a big play in it of – and what I was trying to get at before of being paid to do it is if you've made it for yourself, it's, I think it's definitely DIY. Right. And I think it's what Morley was saying as well is it it's when the guy says, I'm, we're going to build that wall or I'm going to build that wall or I need that wall built. Yeah. Whatever, whatever the same thing he was saying, uh, it's going to end up, there's going to be a wall built and he's going to be able to say, and it's like these people who go, I built that house. Right, Mm. and they didn't build it. They had a plumber in. They got electrical in. They did the framing on that house. 
right? Or maybe they did most of the house, but they, again, subcontracted out. They'll say, mm-hmm. I built that house, right? Mm-hmm. They subcontracted yeah. the roof. They subcontracted the plumbing, the electrical, like, but they installed every, you know, Tr- post and beam. And I don't mean to sound yeah, tra- like tra- this sounds corny. Really for that. It, I don't make this, I mean that, to make this sound corny, but it's actually why at work a lot, I try to use we as much as possible because I don't want to make anyone feel like I'm taking credit for something that they are doing. Because when it comes down to it, if you're working on a team with something, like there's there's not one person that you can attribute the entire outcome to. It's always going to be attributed to multiple people. Um, right. But yeah, it's, like, it's I weird make too. this podcast every week. You, you do. You, <laughs> you edit this podcast and publish it. <laughs> but it, I think it's made more complicated because in in work settings, it also comes down to like who is who is responsible for something. So the person at the lower level is not responsible for the outcome, even though they are the person who is doing the work. The person higher up is responsible for the outcome. So they kind of have some sort of, I don't know, uh, what's the word? They have some like clout in in taking responsibility for it because they can take the blame if something goes wrong so it gets more complicated when you talk about in professional settings but you know you can you can you can deconstruct any larger project and say well oh you built your house well you didn't make the plywood that made the house and that that has been talked about at length by other people (laughs) so just to put a little pin in this and it's not my recommendation. And I've, I've actually never watched uh, one of the videos, but I've heard a lot about this channel and I've wanted to watch it, but the videos are really long. It's make, I think it's make everything where he actually goes and like make it. No, make it. No, he goes and actually makes <laughs> from raw materials. Like he'll take a tree, mm. cut it up uh, and then make the plywood to make the thing, right? Like dry the logs yeah. out, right? Like he takes it from raw materials to the finished project. And if anyone doesn't say that's not DIY, regardless of the amount of tools he uses, then they don't understand DIY. All right. I have a response to that. So I got a package today of some epoxy and out in my front yard, I have a slab of like a cut up tree I have a project coming up where I'm going to be making a jewelry box out of that slab. I'm going to mill up the slab into usable lumber to then make a jewelry cabinet out of, um, and like epoxy to fill the cracks and all that sort of stuff. Where does it become completely DIY if someone else has already given me the slab? So I'm essentially doing what he's done, but someone's already done the slab part for me. Right. And this is where I think, I think a big part of the DIY is that it's a it's a spectrum, right? The whole thing is a yeah. spectrum, and there's different parts of what is DIY. From the the very edge of one side of the spectrum is going to IKEA and buying a coffee table and assembling it, and saying I built this thing, which you did. That's true, but if you were to say it's a DIY coffee table. <laughs> you'd be on the edge of whether or not that's acceptable, right? Mm-hmm. But like my kitchen, I had to design the entire thing. I, it's a whole bunch of different things. It's a DIY kitchen. So, right? so the, the other cabinets, end of like- The cabinets were DIY, but the kitchen as a whole was DIY. Yes, and that's where I yeah. think, I think that's great, mm-hmm. morally. So to put another pin in this conversation, um, <laughs> another bow on top. Uh, let's bring it back to what you were saying earlier, Grant, DIY, D-I-W-H-Y, in that why do people DIY? And I think that is more important than any pedantics, any semantics, whoa, pedantic? That's any pedantic semantics. Any semantics or pedantry about like what exactly is the definition. And you know, why do people do things themselves? They do it to feel a connection to the work, to feel proud of it because they enjoy doing it. Um, to save money, to save money. Right. And so I think any of those reasons and sharing that like passion and, you know, the process is more important than defining exactly what it is. And if it falls into the spirit, then that's great. Hmm. Hmm. I, no, I agree. I agree. We're, so Adam, what, in response to what you were saying, at what point does it become DIY if you didn't slab it? I say, 
well, it doesn't really matter. But if you slabbed it yourself, then that might be an interesting thing to say that you did because some people might find that interesting in addition to milling up the lumber. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I, um, but as I said, like I never use the term DIY. I, I would never, I would never turn around and say, Hey, I like, I DIY'd my own lumber. Like it's just not a thing to me. Um, I know it's, it's not my culture. It's, it's just me personally. I know DIY is a big thing in Australia, but me personally, it's just not part of my thought process. So, yeah. Well, on that note, Clementations. This is someone I've talked about before, um, but it's worth talking about it again. Uh, the Tim Ferriss Show, I'm going to highly recommend. Um, it is a consistently great podcast. I'm always surprised when there is a guest who I haven't heard of or don't think I'd be interested in um, how good they are. So, Actually, I think you guys would both be interested in what I listened to today. It was uh, the most recent interview with Sebastian Younger, who wrote Tribe, uh, which was a quite popular book. Um, and the reason I think you would find it interesting is be- he kind of touches on the generalist versus specialist thing when it comes to the evolution of humans and how humans have become more specialized and kind of what we were talking about and how our society is kind of a result of specialization. Um it was a very solid conversation, very interesting. They also talk about parenting, which you both might be interested in from an evolutionary standpoint um, and how kind of modern British influence parenting differs from um, earlier styles. Um, and yeah, I was listening to just a Q&A episode today, but it, I'm just always like so impressed and um given a lot to think about whenever I listen to one of his episodes. So it's always a solid listen. If you're looking for a podcast, uh, the Tim Ferriss show, I would always give a recommendation for those. That was uh, the May 11th show episode 513 for those wondering where Sebastian Junger was. Uh, and I will download it now. Have a listen tomorrow. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, my clip nation this week is going to be Charlie Underwood on, um, in, on Instagram. I, such a fun guy. He's yeah. such a fun guy. Every every po- every time I see he's done a new story on Instagram, I'm excited to see it. <laughs> well, no, it's going to make me crack up. Um, yeah, so he's <clears throat> excuse me. He's from Berlin. Does a lot of uh, funny things. He loves tiny things, which is pretty funny. Um, yeah, and I also actually have a non clamp mandation, and that is doing okay, whoa, two. Whoa. What? Before you, I wanted to talk about Charlie too. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I don't know if his name is Charlie. I don't know. I don't know if his name is Charlie Underwood or if that is something. I don't know. I call him Charlie. Uh, I think uh, he's great. He did a little tiny reaction uh, yep. video of mine. And I apparently, then looking over that, I've made a lot of tiny stuff. I did not realize it. I made <laughs> tiny clipboards, little, I made tiny little sweaters, clothes. I made yeah. tiny cars, I made tiny everything. And I just went. I didn't even realize. I think I've made more tiny stuff than he has. At this point, you've made more tiny stuff than Ethan Carter. Well, mm. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> yeah. Well, my non my non clamp mandation is doing. I don't know if the camera can pick that up. Two thousand two hundred and fifty six push ups in seventeen days, wow. and I still have a hundred to go today. You can mute me when I just talked in the edit, Adam, if I if the sync makes it not speak in unison with you. I realized that was <laughs> probably terrible. <laughs> well, that's awesome news. Um, for me this week, I'm going to give my shout to someone who doesn't, doesn't need it at all, but I thought it was a really cool video <laughs> and, uh, you know, something that I am 100% with. Uh, Jimmy Duresta on this is the he did a angle grinder hack where he like uh, adds a little loop onto the fr- onto the shield of the angle grinder and I've never used like he's like he showed him like using the little handle that goes on the edge of the angle grinder I've never Who used that, that before people put it on I see people with it all, all the time I also take my uh, my little thing off whatever his shield? little the shield but yeah, if i, I had a, a shield if, on one. right but if i had a hook on it i might have the shield on it mm. what i want is like a like the problem is the shield's like a half shield 
What it really yeah. needs to be is like a quarter shield. So what you do is too much is take the shield off and then use the grinder that you have to cut the shield in half. I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, I might be actually once I, I a, a neighbor of mine is moving uh, and he had a cabinet working shop and he's given me a bunch of free tools, um, including he gave me an arc welder. So I might be able to do this angle grinder hack DIY. Um, he's. I'm also getting a 13 inch uh, jointer planer. And nice. A, yeah, it's wow. It's gonna it's gonna be big. The 13 inch jointer. I already have a 13 inch planer, but I'll sell that because having two planers seems stupid. Um, and uh, you know, getting a 13 inch jointer is going to be game changing. Um, because I currently only have a, a 12 inch, so fi- or uh, sorry, a four inch, and that'll be really nice. Um, and then he's also giving I'm, me. I'm sorry. Um, what? I'm sorry. You're, you're sorry. Yeah, you only have a four inch. Yeah. So normally at this time, <laughs> we would be doing a, our reviews, but we don't have a review this week. So if you want to hear Morley say something in a silly accent, then just go on to either uh, like Podcast Addict has a review service or uh, Apple Podcasts or anything else. And uh, if you do it on anything else, let us know because sometimes we miss them on other services. Um, and let us know, and uh, and Morley will read the review in the accent of your choice, hmm. be it old timey minor or uh, Fargo inspired Minnesota in Minnesotan. I don't know how to say that. Uh, he does that, but instead, this week we have Australian Adam's Australian word of the week. Oh, I got a good one this week. All right, my word of the week this week, my Australian word of the week is root. Hmm. How do you, can you spell that, please? R O O T. Okay. <laughs> Double O. Can you use it in a sentence? I can, okay. but it will give it away. <laughs> All right, let me think. Uh, no, don't use it in a sentence. That's a hard um, one because it's so broad. I mean, I would, it has a few meanings. So, like, the base the of a f- plant. Yeah. Mm, see, it's the funny thing that. is, the funny thing is, it's such it is a massive word here that that if I hear it, it's my first thought is what this is and not the plant. Wow. Yep. I really have so, no idea. I feel like it goes so many ways. Okay, give us one little cl- like clue. Last uh, last night, I went out and had a root. Like a great night, a, a belligerent night. I'd say a lot of drinking. Okay. Root stands for sexual intercourse. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've, so I've got a bit of explaining. There's a bit of an explanation on this. So this one can get really confused to foreigners, can really get foreigners in trouble. There are numerous stories about Americans coming to Australia, telling people how they love to root for their team. Mm. If you come to Australia, you would want to use the word barrack instead. On the same note... A wombat is someone who eats, roots, and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, it, the word "root" here is, is is huge. Like that. Like saying I, I had a root last night is like massive. Like, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I would never, ever, have, ever have gotten that, hmm. but. I would like to thank our Patreon supporters. Um, Without the Patreon supporters, this show wouldn't be possible. Uh, They are uh, the the reason that we exist. They're the, you know, doing this show isn't free. Uh, It also supports things like our website, um, uh, you know, clampcast.com. The thing about Patreon, which I think is really great, is that it gives an opportunity for us to give a little bit extra back to the people who want to support us. And the way that we do that is we do a pre-show where we talk. uh, Sometimes we chat about trying to, you know, get all of our microphones on the same level. Uh, We often talk about what we're drinking tonight. Um, We also do an after show. And sometimes in the after show, we like to talk about uh, 
secret having, stuff. Having roots. <laughs> nope, we never talk. Well, <laughs> maybe tonight. Uh, maybe tonight. Uh, I don't want to have a root with you guys. Uh, so we also every single Patreon gets uh, every single patron on Patreon gets a uh, leather keychain made by Morley Kurt. Um, it is numbered so that you you will know your number, and uh, you will always have that to remind you of how awesome you are and for how long you've been supporting us. Um, and if you want to donate, you can go over to patreon.com slash clamp, um, and you can do that. And if you can't donate, we completely understand. It's, you know, that's the way it is. Um, I I will, for one, will say I, I don't donate to a lot of different places and and I hope the people that I do donate to appreciate it. But if you can't, what you can do, and a lot of people do this, is sharing our uh, podcast on uh, social media, sharing it with your friends. Um, if you thought there was some really good part of a, uh, or a, a particularly good episode, you know, just send them a link and say, hey, I think you might be interested in that. So we discovered today that Grant has to give up drinking Land Shark if you don't know that's his favorite beer. And our pre-show today, we will find out why. So, right, yeah, head over to Patreon to find out why Grant's going to quit drinking beer. Well, I won't go that far. <laughs> uh, I want to thank TF Turning for the theme song. Uh, TF Turning recently hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube and got monetized. So uh, you should go check them out. Um, and yeah, until next time, I want to say uh, cheers and have a great day. Bye. Can't oh, find us anything, wait. but bye. Yeah, bye. don't forget to find us in all those other places that I <laughs> yeah, it's too late. Let's just go to the after show. <laughs> <laughs>